So, a few words of thanks to our national institutes, um, the Field Institute, the Centre de Recherche Mathématique, and PIMS. Um, I'm deeply honored to be uh, to have been chosen for this prize. I must tell you, I feel very, very humbled when I look at the list of previous prize winners, and I realize this is a tremendous privilege. So thank you very much. I was also uh, on sabbatical here about 15 or 16 years, or more than that, 17 years ago, at a wonderful year here at the Fields Institute. So uh, thank you very much for, for this. All right, so I have not uh, planned this talk for experts in the field. So I know there are a few experts in the audience. I apologize to them in advance. My goal is to try to um, tell you why I love the Kerr metric. It's my love song to the Kerr metric, basically. So you know, love songs have emotional components to them. So you will see the emotions coming up. But I, it's, you know, I, it's, I think it's a beautiful piece of mathematics, to mathematical structure. And I hope to be able to share some of the reasons why I think it's beautiful, why it's magnificent with you. All right, so let me, since I'm not assuming that you're all experts in relativity theory, let me briefly tell you about space-time and the Einstein field equations. So, as you probably know, the general theory of relativity is a geometric and relativistic theory of gravitation in which uh, the gravitational field manifests itself through the fabric of space-time via curvature. And it's a theory also where coordinate systems don't have any uh, uh, privileged or, or a special meaning. So in geometry, the realm of spaces in which you don't give special meaning to coordinates is that of manifolds. So a space-time is a four-dimensional manifold, but it's a manifold that remembers uh, that it's coming from the affine space-time in which you and I live today and in which electromagnetic waves propagate. So it's a four-dimensional manifold endowed with an extra structure. G is called the Lorentzian metric. So what does this do? It's, it endows, so if you evaluate this Lorentzian metric at the point X of the manifold, it endows the tangent space to the manifold at X with an um, inner product structure of Lorentzian signature. I'm going to work in signature plus, minus, minus, minus. So each tangent space in this manifold is isomorphic thanks to the uh, Lorentzian metric, to a copy of Minkowski space. So if you want to think of a space-time in, intuitively, you have to imagine that in the tangent space at each point, you have in particular uh, a cone of null directions, which is called the null cone. And each tangent space in fact, you can think of it as an affine space if you like. But it, the tangent vectors living in each tangent space are um, grouped into categories. You have the so-called time-like vectors, which correspond to the tangent vectors around along world lines of observers uh, who travel at speed less than that of light, causal observers. You have Vectors which are tangent to the null cone, these are called null vectors. These co correspond to light rays. And then you have space-like vectors that lie outside the light cone. The fact that you have these two sheets of the light cone endows uh, each tangent space with a causal structure. You can talk about future-pointing time-like vectors 
or past pointing time like vectors, and it also endows the manifold with a, a causal structure. I may say a few words about this a little bit later. So this is space time. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a manifold, so no special meaning to the coordinates, but it remembers each tangent space remembers that it's isomorphic to Minkowski space. So if you look at your world line or mine in this space time, if we're inertial observers, our world line will be a time-like geodesic. So it will be a curve whose intrinsic acceleration is zero, meaning that this vector gamma dot, if we're going towards the future, lies inside the future pointing uh, set of future pointing time like vectors. Okay. So, how do you build in uh, the gravitational field and the Einstein field equations into this? Well, I said that you build this through curvature. So, what is curvature in this context? Well, if you go back to Riemann, who introduced the notion of curvature in these higher dimensional manifolds, the idea is to go back to the metric, and it's the classical notation, if you're working in a coordinate system, defined in a neighborhood of a point. So imagine you have this point x, and you're using local coordinates to denote this point x, so x1 to x4. The Classical notation is to organize the components of the scalar product into a symmetric quadratic differential form. So this is called the Lorentzian metric. This is a quadratic differential form. And what is curvature? Well, curvature measures in an invariant way the difference between this quadratic differential form Let's call it star, and the Minkowski metric, which has, by definition, zero curvature. So I'm going to write it as ds square is eta ij dx i dx j, where eta ij is the constant diagonal matrix with entries 1 minus one, minus one along the diagonal. Okay. So if you want to compare the difference between the two, you can expand the components of Gij as a Taylor polynomial. And if you do this, this is exactly how it appears in the original works. You can always, because you're free to choose the coordinates as you please, you can see uh, how many Taylor coefficients you can kill off at a point. So there is a trick for doing this in geometry. These are called normal coordinates. And if you chose the coordinates appropriately, you can arrange for the terms of degree zero to match the Minkowski metric. You can arrange for the linear terms to vanish as well. And you're left with a combination of quadratic terms. Now I want to make sure I get the numerical constant Correctly, it's minus one third. And you get a bunch of quadratic factors left. So these are skew symmetric linear combinations of a special, that have a special structure. So you observe that these quantities are skew symmetric in the pairs of indices. Uh, sorry, I'm going to write i and j here. And this plus terms, which are of order three in x, these are the remaining terms, and these measure the extent to which your Lorentzian metric fails to be flat, fails to be equivalent to this one. This is called the Riemann curvature tensor. You're absolutely right. Thanks, Walter. Yeah, I think I got it right now. Thank you. This is called the Riemann curvature. So 
involves second derivatives of G, but in a very special way. So if you unwind what this expression is, it has a structure of a curl plus a commutator of something. The something being the components of the connection, the Riemannian connection. Where do the Einstein equations come up? Well, this object here in four dimensions has 20, there are 20 distinct Taylor coefficients that remain. And this 20 splits into 10 plus 10. The first group of 10 corresponds to what's called the Ricci curvature. The other group of 10 corresponds to what's called the Weyl curvature. If you want to understand what Ricci curvature is, one nice way to uh, visualize the Ricci curvature is to think, if you want to think physically, is to take a, a sphere of matter, literally, and, and let it drop and see how the volume changes as that sphere drops. This is a physicist's definition of Ricci curvature. Mathematically, you do it through the comparison of volume elements, again, in normal coordinates. So you write the volume form in the metric, and you compare it to the volume form in Minkowski space. And in those coordinates, you get a correction term. And the coefficients of this quadratic piece correspond exactly to the Ricci curvature. Okay? So it's exactly what I said. You take the sphere of matter and you let it drop. Okay? Now, it took Einstein eight years of hard work. I mean, you know, he certainly knew. Yes? This definition actually only gives you maybe one component of this matrix that gives you the definition. That's right. Well, because I do, but I, with your permission, I would like to move on right now. But I will, I will maybe during questions we can go back to this. That's the thing, exactly. I need to move it around. Exactly. That's right. So you're measuring it. That's right. That's right. But you need to make this precise. But essentially, the answers were given by Spiros and, and Walter. Okay. So it took Einstein between 1907 and 1915 to come up with the correct set of field equations. Um, I won't go into the genesis of these, but in 1915, he finally wrote a um, set of field equations which I think are amongst the great achievements in the history of science. Um, so the field equations are of this form. The right-hand side you can think of as being sources. If you think of Poisson's equation, you can think of the right-hand side as corresponding to the a, a mass distribution, the, the density function for a mass distribution. But you also have equations that govern the fields themselves. So for example, you can think of the psi's as being the components of a Maxwell field, an electromagnetic field. This would be the energy momentum tensor for an electromagnetic field. And the equations that would be governing the psi's would be Maxwell's equations. But the system is very badly coupled because when you write out Maxwell's equations, you're using the Levi-Civita connection of the metric, which is unknown. So the system is extremely coupled. It's highly, highly coupled. So it's coupled. It's coupled and it's nonlinear, of course, because you have quadratic nonlinearities in the Ricci tensor. R is what's called the scalar curvature. It's the trace of the Ricci tensor. Okay. So almost immediately, the first family of exact solutions of this equation was discovered. And you know, it's very unusual when exact solutions actually 
carry a lot of meaning from a physical point of view and from a geometric point of view, but this is one of these happy episodes. Um, and this is what I want to tell you about. Next, I want to tell you about the Schwarzschild solution before telling you about Kerr. So this was discovered in 1915 by Karl Schwarzschild, who was actually serving as a soldier on the Eastern Front during World War I, which is quite extraordinary. And this metric that he's discovered, this family of solutions, is a one-parameter family of solutions which have a lot of symmetry but which are not flat as is the case for the Minkowski metric. So I'm going to write it down for you because it's something that you can, can even do. So the parameter will be called, will be M. This is the round metric on the unit sphere. Okay? And it's a one parameter family. You can think of M as being a positive parameter or non negative parameter. It's constant. And well, if you look at this metric, you can see that it's stationary, so it's got. The components of the metric are independent of t, so d by dt is what's called the killing vector field. What it means is that if you take t and map t to translate t by some constant, the geometry doesn't change. Physically, this corresponds to a space-time geometry which is stationary. Yeah? But it's also spherically symmetric. Why is it spherically symmetric? Well, because the components of this metric depend only on one variable, r, which is radial. So there is an action of the orthogonal group acting on all these round spheres, which are meshed into, isometrically on these round spheres, which are meshed into the geometry. Okay? So it's stationary, it's spherically symmetric. And it, as it happens, it also has very interesting um, implications for not just in geometry, but also in physics. So if you look at this metric, well, something seems to be going wrong at r equals to m. But this is only, a, although it took a while for people to realize this, R equals 2M is not in the coordinate system, but you can extend the metric analytically. You can continue it analytically across this hypersurface R equals 2M and embed isometrically this piece of the manifold into the extended one. And I can do this for you explicitly. You can, this is te textbook material. So you, uh, so R equals 2M, so it's not in the manifold, but you can make a change of coordinates. So if you introduce r star to be the integral of dr over 1 minus 2m over r, and you introduce, I think I used the letter v, v to be t plus r star. So this is like an advanced null coordinate. Then in terms of these new coordinates, the metric now is perfectly regular on r equals 2m. You get 1 minus 2m over r um, dv squared plus 2 dv dr or minus 2 dv dr minus r squared d omega squared. Yes. Pardon? Okay. So now 
R equals 2M is a perfectly regular hypersurface. The metric has been extended across this hypersurface. And the geodesic flow recognizes this pres the presence of this hypersurface in a very, very interesting way, namely in the extended manifold R equals 2M acts as what physicists like to call a one-way membrane or an event horizon. In fact, it's easy to visualize why this happens. Um, so let me put the R direction this way, the T direction that way. This is R equals 2M. And let me introduce, so I've introduced the advanced null coordinate. I'm going to introduce also a retarded null coordinate. So in this picture, if you see how the light cones behave, you'll recognize something that's really, really interesting happening. So these are, in this flattened picture, the level sets of V, and this in the flattened pictures are the level sets of W, the future pointing null cones point in this direction. But once you cross the hypersurface R equals to M, the picture gets reversed, and the future pointing null cones now are going to point in this direction. So once you've crossed this hypersurface R equals 2M by means of a causal curve, you can't go back. Hence the term event horizon, and hence the term black hole. Okay. So a very easy calculation on an exact solution already shows that this is the case. Um, there is a, something else I want to tell you about the Schwarzschild metric before moving on to care. So there is a very useful representation introduced by Roger Penrose, whereby you can look at what are called conformal compactifications of space-time. So in this conformally compactified picture, this extended manifold looks like this. Yes. Um, in increase, an R can get smaller and larger. And then once I cross the similarity, R has to get smaller. Than That's right. In fact, this is, this is exactly what, I'm, what you're going to see on the conformal diagram. It's exactly it. So this is, in this conformally compactified picture, R equals 2M. These are the level sets of R. And as R decreases towards 2M, these level sets are behaving more and more like they would like to be null surfaces, and it's exactly what Robert said. Once you cross R equals 2M, the level sets of R look like this. So this is R equals constant greater than 2M. This is R equals another constant less than 2M. And as R approaches zero, you reach what is the true singularity of the metric, so this is a locus of geodesic incompleteness for this extended manifold. So, for example, null geodesics cannot be extended beyond this singular locus R equals zero. In fact, if you calculate, for example, the square of the Riemann tensor in Schwarzschild geometry, the leading order term blows up as r to the 1 over r to the power 6 as you approach this singularity. So you can't get rid of this by changing coordinates. This is a real singularity in the fabric of space-time. There is so much I can tell you about this. So each of these points is like a two-sphere. Um, and the geometry is really, really interesting if, you're, if you've crossed the event horizon. If you take... Minkowski space, if you take one of these spheres, spherical cross-sections of a null cone in Minkowski space, you have the incoming 
future pointing null geodesics, you have the outgoing future pointing null geodesics. If you follow up this sphere under this null geodesic flow, what you see is that if you start from this surface star, you end up with a sphere whose volume increases corresponding to the outgoing flow and a sphere whose volume decreases corresponding to the incoming flow. So this would be C1, this would be C2. So the, the area of C2 would be less than the area of tau, but the area of C1 would be greater than the area of tau. That's in Minkowski space. But in the Schwarzschild geometry, once you've crossed the event horizon, both these spheres will have smaller area. You can see that. This is exactly what Robert was referring to earlier. Each point in this diagram represents one of these two spheres. As you follow the null geodesics that emanate from that two sphere, you end up on a level set of R, which takes a smaller value than the level set corresponding to the initial position. This is what Roger Penrose called a closed trapped surface. So something like this. Each point in this region is a closed trapped surface. And the famous singularity theorems of Penrose, or the famous singularity of Penrose, theorem of Penrose tells you that if you have a space time which is, which satisfies a causality condition, so the existence of a non-compact Cauchy surface, and if it satisfies a positivity condition, namely that the quadratic form associated to the Ricci tensor is positive for each null vector k, then that space-time cannot be null geodesically complete. So it must be geodesically incomplete for the null geodesic flow, which, which is exactly what you see there. Yes? On closed surface, like a two-sphere, for example. It doesn't have to be any volume. Can have any, as long as it's closed, so compact without boundary. In the case of the Schwarzschild metric, it's a sphere. As it okay. And the, yes? Yes. And the proof is a beautiful application of so the, the Jacobi equation for the non geodesic flow, essentially. This is what is in there. Okay. By the way, you can make this picture completely time symmetric. Right here, I've privileged the advanced null coordinate, but you can also complete this diagram, so to speak, and construct a, what's called the maximal analytic extension which is time symmetric, in which you're gluing together isometrically the piece I had obtained earlier and a, and a time-reflected piece, which will now be covered with the retarded null coordinate to obtain what's called the Kruskal extension. This is textbook material. But this is the story for Schwarzschild. And you can already see there is a lot of very interesting physical content here because black holes are already present in the Schwarzschild geometry. Okay. So very nice exact solution. We like it a lot. Um, spherical symmetry right here. Can you do something similar but with a smaller symmetry group? So can you relax the assumption of spherical symmetry to that of axis symmetry? Seems like a simple enough problem, but it turned out to be, took a long time for these ideas to mature. And also, I think that, you know, for historical reasons, general relativity sort of lost a bit of its cachet for a while until the 1950s, and people started working on this again. Uh, and the main event, next step, was the discovery of the Kerr metric.
This was discovered in 1963. So what Kerr does is that it's in some sense breaks the spherical symmetry of the Schwarzschild metric and gives you something that reduces in the special limited case to the Schwarzschild geometry. Before I write for you what the Kerr metric looks like, I would like to stress the fact that this was not discovered on the basis of any geometric intuition. The Kerr metric was discovered as an exercise in differential geometry, having to do with the properties of the, the geometric properties of the vial tensor, the other piece of the curvature that I didn't talk about. So we can look at things that look like eigenvectors of the vial tensor, but what you think of the vial tensor as a, acting by endomorphisms of um, the, um, the space of self-dual two forms, you can look for eigenvectors associated to this endomorphism. It gives rise to a classification, and it's by trying to work out the different cases in this classification that Kerr discovered this. So I'm going to write the metric for you. So it's not, doesn't come from physics, it really comes from geometric, from geometric ideas that I don't have the time to get into. I'm going to tell you what delta and what all these things are in a moment. Okay, so it's much more complicated looking than the Kerr metric. Let me tell you what these functions delta and u are. So it's a two-parameter family of metrics as opposed to one. So we have two parameters, A and M. Delta is by definition R squared minus 2MR plus A squared. And U is by definition R squared plus A squared cosine squared of theta. A and M are real parameters. M is positive. A can be positive or negative. I'm going to work in the range in which M is strictly greater than A. Um, so exercise. <coughs> set A equals 0 and show that you recover the Schwarzschild metric. So it's a little exercise you can do. So this is truly a deformation of the Schwarzschild geometry. What's the role of these two parameters, A and M? Well, in the Schwarzschild geometry, I didn't have the time to talk about this, but this physically describes the outer gravitational field of a spherically symmetric object which is in equilibrium. M corresponds to the mass measured from infinity. See, in relativity, mass, angular momentum are not local objects. They're objects that can only be measured asymptotically at infinity because the coordinates don't have any intrinsic meaning. So you can't really work locally to define mass and angular momentum. So M is mass, and A is angular momentum per unit mass. Doesn't matter, I mean, if you're, you can think of this as a two-parameter family of metrics. What's the range of the coordinates? So here, T runs from minus to plus infinity. R is bounded below by R plus, where R plus is the largest of the two roots of this quadratic polynomial. And theta phi are spherical coordinates on the two sphere. Okay? All right. Now, what about symmetry properties? Well, this metric admits d by dt and d by d phi as killing vector fields. So there is an abelian action 
the action of a two-dimensional abelian group that's acting by isometries on this geometry, right? If you look at the components of the metric, they don't depend on T and phi explicitly. But something really interesting happens with P by dt, which is that if you calculate the you want to determine the causal type of d by dt, so very important remark, if I calculate g of d by dt with itself, what I'm going to get is 1 over u r squared minus 2mr plus a squared cosine squared of theta. So <laughs> there is a region with compact closure, which lies outside this hypersurface where R is equal to R plus, where this generator of time translations, D by DT, changes causal type. So here, D by DT lies inside the light cone, but in this region, D by DT lies outside the light cone. So here, it's time-like. And here it's space-like. Okay. For analysis, it makes your life very complicated because if you want to use energy methods to study the long-term behavior of waves in this geometry, the fact that the energy, that d by dt becomes space-like in this region means that the, any conserved energy that you would want to write for the wave equation, for Maxwell's equations, for any of the standard wave equations will fail to be positive throughout this region in which the manifold is defined. What are the coordinates? So are the two. Oh, sorry. So this is the hypersurface R equals R plus, and this region is the region so on the boundary of this region, d by dt is null. And once you cross this boundary, d by dt becomes space-like. So is this tr? Yeah, that's right. I've just flattened my picture. Ah, so this is, there is terminology for this. This is called the ergosphere in the standard parlance. This will be the event horizon. And this is called the stationary limit surface in standard terminology. OK? In the sense? So in the sense that there is a unique linear combination of d by dt and d by d phi, so you need it's not enough to go along the orbits of d by dt. You need to shift d by dt by a certain multiple of d by dc to make up for this effect. And this linear combination will become null on the event horizon. Okay? That's in, in that sense, it's called. I want to briefly mention. Yes. So this is the event horizon. Yeah, yeah. So this is the event horizon. So I guess the outer one is the other root of the polynomial of the top of it. No, no, no. This, this is somewhere else. This but is it's a, it's a number. But it has to no, it's not. A, it's a, no, no. It's not a number. It's a, it's a hypersurface. That's a hyper. This is the set in which this is zero. Exactly. All right. Good. It's a hypersurface. Okay. Does that answer your question? So it depends on the data. Absolutely. That's right. So it, it meets the event horizon on the axis, which is the vertical line I've drawn there. Okay? Yes. The axis is the zero set of d by d phi. D by d phi. Okay? All right. Let me very briefly mention an extremely important result connected to the Kerr metric, which is the so-called black hole uniqueness theorem. So 
So, so this geometry describes what's called the domain of order communication or the exterior geometry of a rotating black hole in equilibrium. So the exterior geometry of a rotating black hole in equilibrium. It's an exact solution you might expect. So in equilibrium means that you have this killing vector d by dt, which is time-like when you go sufficiently far. Okay? Rotating means that you have this killing vector d by d phi closed orbits, which vanishes on the axis. Obvious question is to know if there are any other solutions that satisfy these, the symmetry condition that there exists a killing vector which is time-like sufficiently far, so that this configuration looks like an equilibrium configuration, and which satisfies the natural boundary conditions that you would put in, namely the presence of an event horizon with spherical topology and asymptotic flatness at infinity. So this was worked, this was a problem that was worked on with great energy by relativists in the 60s and the 70s. And the theorem says that if you're looking at the black hole equilibrium state or configuration, and if you assume that the manifold is analytic, then every such solution must belong to the Kerr family. So black hole uniqueness theorem, C omega implies Kerr. Recently, and this is you know, beautiful, very, very important work of uh, Spiros Alexakis, Alexander Ionescu, and Sergio Kleinerman, what they have done is that they have, because, you know, this hypothesis is certainly from a physical point of view is completely unjustified. Okay. So they've shown that the key step in the proof of the black hole uniqueness theorem works under much, much weaker regularity assumptions. The key step or one of the key steps, is a problem of extending killing vector fields off the horizon. In the analytic case, they use koshi kovalevskaya to do this. Of course, if you're not in the analytic situation, you can do this. And this was done by, by Spiros and his collaborators. It's a beautiful paper. I don't have the time to uh, say more about this, but this is uh, it's very important to say that you don't need this and you can prove strong results. Four. By the way, you can also construct a maximal analytic extension of this um, manifold. It's very interesting. I don't have the time to to get into this, but because of the presence of this angular momentum factor, the singular set now takes the form of a ring. So it corresponds to r equals 0 and theta equals pi by 2. And you can play the same type of game I played in Schwarzschild and construct a maximum analytic extension. This was done by Carter in the 60s. And instead of having just one Kruskal diagram, you get a manifold with countably many copies of this exterior geometry coming in with all sorts of strange phenomena and causal uh, related to the causal structure, but I don't have the time to talk about this. Four, separability properties. So in the abstract of the talk, I quoted Chandrasekhar, who said that the Kerr metric had properties which have the aura of the miraculous. 
what he was referring to were the separability properties of the Kerr metric. So we have these two killing vectors, d by dt and d by d phi, uh, defined that generate uh, an isometric group action. But it turns out that, for example, if you write the, so these are killing vector fields, But it turns out that, so I'll write this as a meta theorem. Every wave equation that you can think of in this geometry. So here I'm referring to the scalar wave, Klein Gordon equation, Dirac equation with or without mass, Maxwell. Linearized Einstein, is separable in Kerr. So you can write down all the E's that govern individual modes for these waves. Why is that? Well, it's related to the symmetry properties of the Kerr metric that are present beyond the presence of these two commuting killing vector fields. So why? Well, we know the answer at least for waves and Dirac and also the Hamilton-Jacobi equation for the geodesic flow. all of which are separable. So for all these equations, the reason is that there exists beyond these two commuting killing vector fields an additional symmetry that's generated by an object which is called the killing Yano tensor. So what is a killing Yano tensor? It's a skew-symmetric tensor. It's a two-form which satisfies a, an analog of the killing equation. And you can write it down. It has a very simple expression. It's a form of maximal rank. You can write it in a certain moving frame, you can write it like this. The thetas are elements of a null moving frame. It's a very simple object. Out of the killing Yano tensor, you can construct differential operators that commute with either the down version the Dirac operator, or that give rise to operators that, to first integrals that Poisson commute with the Hamiltonian for the geodesic <laughs> flow, um, and that account for the separability. So, for example, for the Dirac operator, so for the Dirac equation, in Kerr geometry, separation of variables was proved by Chandra Sekar in 1976. You get separation of variables. What are the modes? Well, the modes are labeled, but they will be Dirac spinners of the form psi equals e to the minus i omega t, e to the i k plus one half phi times a spinner whose components are products of function of r and function of theta. 
there is one separation constant corresponding to the killing vector d by d phi, another one corresponding to d by d phi, and then you pick up an additional separation constant here that depends on both omega and k. The fact that it depends on omega and k is related to the fact that in the Kerr metric, you have cross terms involving dt and dc. Geometrically, this has to do with the fact that the vector field d by dt is not hypersurface orthogonal. It twists. What's the link with the uh, Killingiano tensor? Well, out of the Killingiano tensor, you can construct an operator that commutes with the Dirac operator. So there is an operator K that depends on F, which commutes with the Dirac operator and admits the spinner as an eigenspinner for modes. So you have modes at your disposal. You can do the same thing for scalar wave equation. We don't know how to do this for Maxwell or the linearized Einstein equation. Sorry, sorry, this is sort of the analog of the analysis? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So the next step is to use these modes to solve the Cauchy problem for the Dirac equation. Okay, so five. Yes. Yes, the four component. That's right. That's right. I mean, according to a certain pattern. So same story for the D'Alembertian operator, but we don't know anything about Maxwell or. Um, Linearize Einstein. We can separate variables, but we don't have, I mean, to my knowledge, there is no interpretation of the separation constant oh, there in terms of a Killingiano tensor, although I expect it should be true. That's right, exactly. <laughs> the corresponding guy for boxes of order two. There is a recent paper by Lars Anderson, Peter Blue, and Thomas Bechtal, in which they, it's very elaborate, <laughs> very, very elaborate, in which they construct such a thing, but the exact link to the modes for Maxwell's equations is not being worked out. The remaining five minutes or so, let me tell you a bit about things that you can do with these modes. So long-term dynamics. So the Dirac equation is really it's the easiest of all, even though algebraically as an operator it's the most complicated. And the reason is that for the Dirac equation, you can do, you can solve the Cauchy problem in a Hilbert space setting. So you can use the Dirac current. For those of you who know about the Dirac current, to set up a Hilbert space structure on the space of initial data, and then you can solve forward in time. Yeah, yeah. Spin one half particles. There. You get a Hilbert space setting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. And then you can prove decay theorems. For example, if you take the integral over a compact annular region contained in a hypersurface T equals constant of 
the Dirac current, and you take the limit of this integral, so this is contained as a compact annular region in t equals constant, and you take the limit that as t goes to infinity, this limit is zero. So this tells you that if you wait long enough in any compact spatial region, the integral of the Dirac current will get as small as you want. That's the easy case. So this is a theorem, well, I shouldn't say easy, I mean, it takes work. It's, I should say it's less difficult. It's not easy. Oh, this is the future pointing unit normal to the hypersurface t equals constant. And mu is the induced volume. That's right. So since the hypersurfaces t equal constant are space-like, this is a Riemannian volume element. Okay. Much more difficult is the case of scalar waves. And the difficulty comes from this ergosphere, this region in which d by dt becomes space-like. So loss of positivity. Um, ergosphere. So implies conserved energy is not positive. So this is work I was involved in with Felix Finster. Joel Smaller and STEA. We looked at modes in which K is fixed. Again, using separation of variables and doing Fourier analysis. No. The, the, the one above is not for modes, it's for. L2 initial, that's right, L2 initial data, L infinity near the event horizon. True. That's right, exactly. That was exactly the point we were discussing earlier. But not all of the the way the question Exactly. So for this, you get something, same type of result. Much more work, much, much more work. Okay. Until recently, results which did not concern individual modes dealt with the case of slowly rotate. Yes. Yes. For this last equation, for variables are in state that you have k5, yeah? So you, you mean the integral, but you just don't write it. I don't write it. That's right. In fact, you can even get pointwise decay too, but I'm not writing it either. Yes, yes, but I'm not writing it. Okay. Yeah. Especially compared away from the event horizon, but then as T flows, of course, part of the wave crosses the event horizon and gets absorbed. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So until recently, if you didn't want to deal with individual modes, there were theorems due to Fermos and Rotnyansky dealing with so-called Sloker using totally different methods. They're using multiplier methods. But this is the case in which the angular momentum is small relative to the mass. And until February of 2014, I mean, there were efforts being made. There was important work by Tataru and Tohaneanu also on 
trying to lift this uh, slow care assumption. And recently, there is a very impressive preprint by the firmos Rotnyansky and Schlappentoch Rothman in which this assumption is lifted. So, 2014, the firmos Rotnyansky and Schlappentoch Rothman have proved decay for the full, what's called subextremal care. So you get decay in the full range. Absolute value of A less than M. Which is, I, mean, it's a, I think it's a tremendous achievement. But it's an 80 page long paper and I'm still in the process of trying to to understand and digest it, but it's a remarkable achievement. Okay. Briefly, perspectives, and I will end with that. Directly related to the care metric, proving decay for Maxwell and linearized Einstein, I think is that should be within reach, but it's hard. All of these are, you know, steps towards the, you know, the big prize, which is to prove nonlinear stability of care, of course. I think this should be within reach, but it's hard. If you're interested, I can tell you why I think it's hard, but it's hard. Uh, and in particular, I think understanding the role of the Killingiano tensor will be key to making this work. And up to now, we don't have that. But I, I'm absolutely convinced that this is a necessary There is very interesting work also having to do with the existence of exponentially growing modes or so, I should say solutions or modes with finite energy. But these exist when you're dealing with the uh, case in which the, there is a mass term in the Klein-Gordon equation. So this is recent work also of Schlapp and Tach Rothman that I think is very interesting, needs to be better understood. Uh, so the context in which it applies needs to be better understood because I think it's a special instance of a more general phenomenon that needs to be further explored. And I'm almost done, 30 seconds. The care metric has higher dimensional generalizations. These are called the Myers-Perry metrics. So what can you say about long time dynamics in those higher dimensional uh, generalizations? An interesting problem because you have several axes of symmetry, you have several angular momentum parameters. It's interesting to see how they interact with each other. I have a result for the Dirac equation that I did with Thierry Daudet, who was a postdoc at McGill, student of Jean-Philippe Jean Nicolas, for Dirac in dimension five. And we use, no, no, so whole, all dimensions, all dimensions. And we use the different technique. We use the Moore estimate methods that I, Thierry was an expert on and I learned from, uh, I learned from Thierry about them. Pardon? The positive commutator uses Moore theory.
Um, at the bottom of the list, because I think this is the ultimate goal, is the nonlinear stability. Okay, I think this is a fundamental question that has to be addressed. Hopefully, it will be solved with, you know, before too long. But in between, there are also different geometries at infinity. So you can look at, instead of looking at Kerr, you can also look at what's called Kerr the sitter or Kerr anti the sitter. So instead of being asymptotically Euclidean, the manifold is asymptotically like hyperbolic space or like anti the sitter space. Uh, so constant negative sectional curvature Lorentzian. What can you say about dynamics? Well, very interesting work of Dyatlov and Zworski that I would like to mention, and also Andras Vazi on resonances in Kerr de Sitter. So these are modes, but where omega, the imaginary part of omega is in the, where omega lies in the lower half plane. These give you information about rates of decay. For solutions. So there is a lot to be done, but I, to conclude, this is my, my love song to the Kerr metric. You know, all of this, in my mind, or at least from my perspective, one of the things that makes all of this possible is that there is a very rich geometry. And at the kernel of this geometry is this very fascinating Killingiano tensor that generates, seems to generate every other property of the geometry just starting from that. So I think it deserves to be better understood. Okay, thank you. I've gone over time. Thanks. And I'll tell, I'll tell you why. It's because if you just require the existence of a killing Yano tensor, this does not force the metric to be Einstein. Problem is that when you study, say, the linearized Einstein equations, and you want to set up the Cauchy problem and study long-term behavior of solutions, you need to take care of issues having to do with choice of coordinates and choice of frames, because you want to work with quantities which are independent on the choice of coordinates and choice of frame. So there is a technique for doing this, which goes back to Tukolsky, um, which takes the linearized Einstein equations, which he writes by linearizing the Bianchi identities and then decoupling them to write second order equations in terms of the Bianchi for the curvature invariance. The problem is that for this decoupling to work, you need a piece of the curvature to vanish. And that piece of the curve, the vanishing of that piece of curvature in particular happens when the metric is Einstein. So if you don't have Einstein, you can't get the decoupling to work. That's the problem. But if you do, then sure. For example, the non-smooth Yes. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, both papers on that. Yeah. So, this analogy? Yes, it does. In fact, there's an analogy. In, there is a very simple interpretation in terms of the geodesic flow. So if you take the... Look at the geodesic in your manifold. So you know the tangent vector along the geodesic has constant norm. You apply the Killing-Yano tensor to it. right? If the, you can associate to the Killing-Yano tensor an endomorphism of the tangent space. You get another vector field which is defined along the geodesic, which is now no longer tangent to it. 
and that other vector field is parallel transported. So the Killingiano tensor is a machine to generate parallel transported vector fields along geodesics. So there is an interpretation in terms of quote unquote classical mechanics because it gives rise to vector fields which are parallel transported. So in the rest frame, that vector field has constant components. It's a conservation law. Classically, you could also uh, not only have single looking stars that are stable. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, what is the prospect? Is there any kind of analogy to the model? So, the, so there are exact solutions that are supposed to model situations like this, but there is no uniqueness theorem unless the case of care. And so, you, some people have worked at solving wave equations in those geometries, but it's a problem that Spiros was alluding to earlier. I mean, they may have nice um, sort of local properties, but their singularity structures are, are really problematic. 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 So interpreting long-term dynamics in this context is, is, is a treacherous game. But formally, it can be done, yes. Yes. Well, I think there are results now out. I mean, Spiros knows this better than I do. You perturb something with a zero angular momentum and it might develop some angular momentum. So, as people tell me, if you want to understand short stuff, you better understand. Okay. Sure. Right. So it's kind of mixed. Yeah, it's mixed. There might be some results. That's right. Can you do, for example, short good? With uh, perturbations, that's right. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's what I've heard too. So. <laughs> so what's the uh, is that uh, Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose that we ask our further questions. Uh, Thank you. Um, with a few things, uh, there are some nice, uh, there's a few goodies, a t shirt, a talk, wonderful. A paper, wonderful. And there's also an envelope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Walter. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.